the Montgomery County Council is sponsoring, along with the Montgomery County Republican Central Committee and the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee, a public discussion of Montgomery County's new public financing system for county elections. This will take place here in this building on Monday, June 15th at 7 p.m. And uh, Jared DeMarinus of the Maryland State Board of Elections, our former colleague Phil Andrews, the sponsor of the new campaign finance law, and Bob Drummer, our senior legislative attorney, will provide a briefing for members of the public on how the new campaign finance mechanism will work. It's important that um, members of the public understand who uh, are interested in participating in the uh, political process in any way that the county council did act last year. We passed historic legislation to take special interest money out of our elections. It's our full intent to have this system up and running in 2018, uh, which will be the next election for county executive and county council. The new law only covers those offices, um, but it is uh, uh, new. It will take um, some time for, you know, work out the kinks, work out the bugs. Um, but it's also important that those who want to uh, contribute money to uh, the executive or council understand that the rules have significantly changed. There will be a limit of $150 per individual. And uh, if an executive and, or, or if a candidate for executive or candidate for council seeks to participate in the 2018 process, it's, it's an opt-in, um, they will not be able to accept contributions of more than $150 or from corporations or from labor unions. So um, it, the purpose of this a discussion in, on June 15th is uh, to get people prepared, but also to have donors understand that um, there's a new rule book, a new playbook um, for 2015, and some of the checks that uh, elected officials may have been taking or prospective candidates may have been taking in the past, they won't be taking if they are going to opt in to this system. I will say uh, right up front, I don't think anyone knows what he or she will be doing in 2018. It's a long time from now. But given that we are having this dialogue this year in the first year of the four-year cycle, and given that it is a priority for the county council to put a down payment into the public campaign fund in this year's budget, um, I felt it was a timely discussion uh, and important for people to understand how the new law will work. So uh, we welcome the press. Um, it, I think it'll be a very good and very interesting discussion, and I wanted to let you know about that. I also want to let you know that on Monday, May 11th, the County Council will take up the Police Department's budget. And um, is Patty still here? I, I do need, yeah. Um, and on Monday, May 11th, we will have a discussion of the body cameras pilot program, which Chief Manger intends to implement in fiscal year 2016. But that conversation will mostly focus on the body cameras, we have scheduled on the County Council agenda of June 9th a discussion with Chief Manger regarding community relations generally. Um, Chief Manger, as with all the chiefs of the large counties, uh, was involved working with um, Governor Hogan, the State Police, the National Guard in uh, uh, the events in Baltimore over the last week, and of course um, the entire United States and the world. Uh, eyes are on the topic of policing, the events, the terrible events over a long period of time, but especially in the last year, that gave rise to the Black Lives Matter movement. And so uh, we want Montgomery County to be an enlightened community. We do not ever want to see racial profiling or the circumstances in Montgomery County uh, degenerate to a place where citizens can't trust that the police will be impartial and um, responsive without regard to uh, race or language or economic circumstances. And so um, Chief Manger will join us on June 9th for that wide-ranging conversation. And we look forward to hearing from the chief about the lessons learned over um, the course of the last year and um, how he wants to continue to bring enlightened leadership to Montgomery County's police department. So those are the two announcements I wanted to make all of you aware of. And I'm available now uh, to um, field any questions that any of you may have. Quick question on the funding. This, again, is an opt-in on um, public funding? Yes, that's correct, Kate Ryan, asking about whether it's an opt-in. A candidate seeking the office of executive or council may elect 
in 2018 to continue raising uh, dollars from um, companies or unions up to $4,000 per contribution, uh, a candidate who chooses to use the old mechanism of fundraising would not be eligible for county matching funds, whereas a candidate who opts in to the new system will have individual contributions of up to $150 matched in some cases doubled or tripled uh, depending on how much money the candidate has raised um, and the full details of exactly how the law works will be discussed on June 15th, and I hope the press will attend. I think uh, it's complicated and it's new, um, and, and I think there's a lot of people are going to be interested in learning. I hope a lot of people will be interested in how it works. And I sincerely hope a lot of people, because one of the ideas uh, behind the new law is that um, the current system of raising very, very large dollar amounts from interested parties uh, is, uh, uh, dissuades individuals from seeking public office. And um, we will see whether 2018 is a more competitive election. I think competitive elections are healthy for democracy. And I want to be very clear, I'm entering into this conversation without any, I have no idea what I or any other council member uh, will be doing in 2018. This is not to lay the groundwork for our own campaigns, although clearly some of us will be participants in the 2018 election. This is simply to explain to the public there's a new set of rules. It is complicated. We believe it provides substantial benefit for the conduct of elections um, and taking special interest money out of elections. If I, if I can follow up, a lot of people look at this, um, it's kind of like positive ads. Everyone says they hate negative ads and they hate special interest money, but even Hillary Clinton, who has plans on making this a big part of her campaign, right now the money she is taking, she's not, you know, not taking money from certain areas. How do you persuade the public that this can really work and could clean up some of the influence that, that is in politics right now? Well, I, I hope that the conversation June 15th will begin uh, a public understanding that there is significant benefit to what we've done here in Montgomery County. And as on so many issues, Montgomery County is out in front. Um, we're uh, taking a very progressive approach to making public policy. And um, the 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 facts will come out as time goes by. I mean, I think there's always a fair amount of distrust of, of political leaders, but um, our system of government requires that people run for office and be willing to take on these responsibilities. And, and all of us who supported the law, which it passed unanimously, believe that it will be a process that will facilitate more competition. Um, and as people understand it better, I hope they will be persuaded that our decisions are made in the public interest and not with regard to uh, special interest donating to our campaigns. Of course, I, I, am, I can confidently state that in 12 years in office, I've made every decision in the public interest. I don't believe that um, people who give me money have any more influence over my decisions than um, any, any other constituent. I represent all of my constituents. But I, I do understand that the concern over special interest contributions gives rise to cynicism and distrust. And so I'm, I'm, I'm a strong supporter of this new law, and I hope that uh, the public will um, have greater confidence in the decisions being made by their elected officials uh, once this new system is in place. The money for the public financing, where will that come from? From the taxpayers. From, taxpayers. from the county general fund. Oh, are you, so it's from the general fund. I'm sorry, I should repeat Matt Bush. Um, <laughs> the question was, where does the matching dollars come from? And the answer is from the county general fund. But there won't be anything new to pay for this. It'll just come from, you'll divert money and there won't be any new taxes or fees to do this. Obviously, the state you know, reinstituted the checkbox on the on the on income taxes. The county can do anything like that. To so I'm I'm repeating each question because we have this uh, conference on video, and sometimes the questions are too hard to hear. And when I just launch in an answer, mm -hmm. anyone watching the video can't hear the question. So the question was, um, what is there a revenue source for the public campaign fund? There is not at present. Uh, the way the law was established, it's just up to the county council to appropriate the dollars. And um, in his FY16 budget proposal, the county executive didn't include any funding for this purpose. Um, we have a citizen committee to estimate the cost of public elections that will be working over the course of the next year, and it will report back to us. So we don't precisely know what our dollar target is. There was an estimate of about $8 million, but that's uh, just an estimate, and we hope to have a clearer understanding in the next couple of years. But um, as hard as it is going to be to find the $2 million that the Government Operations Committee placed on the reconciliation list, I think it would be an insuperable task if we waited until year four and then all of a sudden had to appropriate those dollars. So um, this is a, a, an issue on which the executive and council are not in agreement. The executive did not set aside any money for that purpose in fiscal 16, and the council 
uh, believes that we need to make a down payment and begin the process of funding this. Heard now that the indictments have been handed out, curfew lifted, the National Guard I was pulled out uh, late last night. Uh, what are your thoughts on the situation in Baltimore and how it was handled? What are my thoughts on the situation in Baltimore and how it was handled? Baltimore is a neighbor. Baltimore is an enormously important American city. Baltimore has a great deal to offer. Baltimore has a tremendous knowledge infrastructure. Johns Hopkins University, the University of Maryland, the University of Baltimore, Morgan State, Coppin State. Um, Baltimore is a, a place of higher learning. It's a place of great culture. And I do have every confidence that as time goes by, um, individuals, residents, tourists, visitors, sports fans, companies will again feel confident about um, seeking uh, jobs and entertainment in this in Charm City. We all believe in the future of the city of Baltimore. It's tragic that it took rioting in the streets to bring attention to the enormous disparities in, in wealth and job skills and education that are not new in the city of Baltimore. But um, the entire state of Maryland depends on the success of Baltimore. We need Baltimore to thrive again. I'm confident that it will. But at the same time, we can't again close our eyes to uh, the issues that gave rise to the rioting. We have um, disconnected youth without, not in school, not at work. We've got to provide answers for those youth. We have them here in Montgomery County as well. There are lessons to be drawn from what's occurring in Baltimore that we've got to pay attention to in Montgomery County and in every other jurisdiction. It should not take rioting in the streets to bring our attention to the fact that a whole generation of disconnected youth may not see a bright future for themselves. And so, um, so the entire state has an obligation to the city of Baltimore, certainly uh, Montgomery County taxpayers now um, contribute substantially more than we get back, but, but we understand that there's a role for wealth equalization, and I think Montgomery County believes we have a responsibility to assist the city of Baltimore, and I believe we'll continue to do so in the future. If I may follow up on Baltimore, Chief Major, I mean, we had 50, about 50 officers in there, I think, from last Saturday we did. until Sunday. Have you spoken to Chief Major I have. about the police and their experiences in Baltimore? Um, the question was, have I spoken with Chief Manger about the county force's experiences? Yes, I have. I was in touch with Chief Manger throughout, and um, I'm actually, along with uh, uh, Chairman Elrich of the Public Safety Committee, we're going to sit down uh, for an after-action analysis on Wednesday, a private meeting with the chief, and then the chief will, on June 9th, provide a public discussion of the lessons learned, uh, both with respect to the um, specific events in Baltimore, but also more broadly about how do we have an enlightened police force and not uh, in any way um, uh, have um, questions about the fairness or the lack of prejudice in our police department. Our police department protects the public without regard to uh, race or economic circumstance or language, and um, we want to continue to have in place procedures that uh, make sure that we are an enlightened police department in which our community can have confidence. And that'll be an excellent discussion on June 9th with Chief Manger. Before that, you're going to talk body cameras, though. And on May 11th, we're going to discuss body cameras. Is that 100 co officers will have the cameras during the pilot program? I believe that's right. I'm, I'm looking forward to the discussion on May 11th. I'm not in a position. I'll, I'll know a lot more after when we have that like conversation. would like every officer have body cameras? Obviously, the state did pass some bills this year that would set up the regulations to allow that. When would you like to see every officer in Montgomery County have one? Uh, Matt Bush asked, when would we like to see every officer in Montgomery County uh, have body cameras, and I would just say as soon as feasible, uh, and we're going to have a, a good discussion on May 11th. I, I'm not a member of the Public Safety Committee, so um, I haven't participated much in the conversation up to now, but I am meeting Chief Manger on Wednesday, and um, the entire council will get a full briefing and will be much better equipped uh, to understand where the police department's um, priorities lie and where we believe our priorities should lie in our May 11th discussion. And following up on Baltimore quickly again, I know you're going to talk about lessons learned, but as of right <coughs> now, if, if something like Freddie Gray happened here, what, I mean, what would be the protocol? What would you, what would happen if that were to happen here? The question is, what if there were a death in police custody as occurred with Freddie Gray, and um, what would Montgomery County's approach be? And I don't know that any of us can can identify ahead of time um, how you're going to respond if a tragic incident occurs. I, I hope that um, our public would remain calm, and I think it's up to all of us as elected officials to state that um, we believe that it is the police's responsibility to provide protection and be responsive to every resident, regardless of uh, background, race, or um, language spoken. We have 
uh, more foreign-born residents in Montgomery County than in any other jurisdiction. We have no demographic group in Montgomery County representing a majority. In Montgomery County, we are all minorities. And um, so I know that the African-American community in particular uh, feels that um, they just don't have a good relationship with the police, that, there's, that uh, parents feel they need to have the talk with young men in particular. And that's, that's a shame. We should look at police as working for us and not as antagonistic or hostile. And so um, our conversation on June 9th will emphasize those principles and how do we uh, build confidence in our public, in our police department, in this enlightened and progressive county, which believes in equal justice and fairness and which welcomes people of every background. We, we believe that the fact that we are an international gateway, the fact that we have a long-standing historic African-American community, which is very successful, is our great strength, that we have the ability to work together and bring people together for a common purpose, regardless of background, regardless of language spoken at home. We believe very strongly in those principles, and um, it's our job as elected officials to reinforce those principles. Can I follow up? It wasn't so long ago, or it may be actually uh, years ago, that the Montgomery County was under the police department a three-year Department of Justice investigation for um, singling out blacks. Uh, and what do you think has changed since then? And what are you hearing from your constituents? Do you ever get complaints? Or are we are we that good that we don't have this happening, as, as far as you know? Right. So. Um Kate Ryan asked, how good are we? And, and uh, there have been incidents, and there was a Department of Justice investigation in the past. Uh, our police department is not perfect. No public institution is perfect. And um, it falls to all of us to identify the lessons learned from these events, um, not only in Baltimore, but also in Ferguson, also in New York City, also in many other communities. And, and um, there are lessons to be learned. And I know that Chief Manger and, and every officer is pondering how we can do better and, and how to avoid um, circumstances in future that would cause the public to distrust our police department. We're not perfect and we, we have lessons to be learned and that's uh, going to be our, our focus on June 9th. We, we, we're not claiming to be better or different, um, but we aspire to be better and, and we continue to aspire and we continue to reinforce those principles of equal justice. And at, at this hour in Prince George's County, um, there is a call, once again, for Governor Hogan to please release monies for education. Um, can I ask you how you think he's doing on that score, and how do you think he did in terms of his handling of what happened in Baltimore as a new governor who, you know, pledged to bring people together, that there would be bipartisanship? What do you think? So the question is about Governor Hogan's performance. First of all, as I said at our last meeting, I absolutely hope that he will release the funds that the state legislature appropriated for our school system. I don't see any purpose in sitting on those funds. It's not enough money to really make a, a major difference in improving the state's fiscal position. We're already a AAA rated state and um, one of the reasons that our state has such a good reputation is because we have such good schools. We can't underinvest in those schools. So um, I, I just don't see any purpose to be served uh, by Governor Hogan being stubborn and refusing to release those dollars. I hope he will release them right away. As far as um, the performance uh, of, of uh, Governor Hogan and the National Guard and the State Police and the Baltimore City Police and the Montgomery County Police, you know, really th these were enormously challenging circumstances. Um, I'm not aware today of any injuries or harm done to the residents of Baltimore by the police. If there are reports of those, they haven't come to my attention. So I think that um, the response to the rioting was uh, sensitive and careful and um, commensurate. Um, and as far as Governor Hogan's performance, um, you know, he responded and he was present in the city and, um, you know, I hope that he will continue to pay attention to the city's needs and to our large uh, counties which have substantial urban populations. He, um, you know, we've gotten different signals from the governor about who he really attends to. Sometimes he says he's a nonpartisan leader who uh, responds to all the people of Maryland and other times he says, well, I know who elected me and I'm going to take care of those needs first and it's not a secret that Baltimore City, he didn't carry Baltimore City, he didn't carry Montgomery County, he didn't carry Prince George's County, but he's our governor now and he needs to respond to all of those needs. Do you think he did a good job? Um, I, do, I do think Governor Hogan did a good job. Where are you on the energy tax? I mean, it sounded today like you're going to back Nancy's proposal. I support some reduction in the energy tax. It's too early to say whether we will get to the full 10% or not. I don't, I don't know that yet. We'll work that out. Um, 
when we sit down and, and measure everything and figure out what we can afford to do. I support some reduction in the energy tax this year. Okay, but from, a, I guess, a broader perspective now, with the county executive talking about how next year a tax increase might be unavoidable. I mean, are we, are we getting to a point where the, the discussion every year about 10% energy tax reduction, I mean, that seems to be the, like the negotiation every year. It is a negotiation every year over the energy tax, how much we can afford to reduce it. That is a, a, a negotiation every year. Right, but so is that going to continue this way every year? We're, we're talking about 10% or you know, last year 7% or is there at some point going to be a complete sunset? Like I, I think the negotiation will continue as long as a majority of council members want to fulfill the promise that we made that in the depths of the recession, the dramatic increase in the energy tax was temporary. A majority of council members still want that to be the case and to make it temporary, and a majority of council members have supported some reduction in that increase each year, and each year the county of executive has said, we can't afford to do that, please don't do it. So um, we'll continue to be at odds on that issue as long as each side of the d discussion holds the position we have held and we hold today. There was quite a reaction um, with all the council members when Jennifer Hughes mentioned that the county council is contemplating adding an additional $31 million to the um, county's e executive's proposed $51 million. Um, was that a misleading 67% increase that she uh, claimed? Um, Jennifer Hughes, the director of OMB, warned us against spending more money. That's part of her job. Um, we are going to be very cautious and prudent uh, with respect to how much we add to the budget, but. The, the voters of Montgomery County invested in the county council the authority to spend their tax dollars on priorities that the public values, whether that's higher education, whether it's a significant down payment on clean elections, um, whether it's certain areas in public health that uh, were not addressed. And so um, the county council will exercise the authority we have and we will fulfill our priorities, recognizing that for the most part, the priorities that the executive identified are consistent with our priorities. And also following up on the um, public finances system, did you, I don't know if you already addressed this or not, but can you talk about how this may or may not encourage diversity? Um, you just mentioned that Montgomery County is a county that does not have one majority um, demographic. So the question was wh whether our new clean election system will encourage people from different backgrounds to run for office and whether we could end up with uh, a, a landscape of elected officials that better reflects the population. Of course, I certainly hope that. And, um, Throughout my career, I've supported uh, individuals from different backgrounds uh, running for office, um, and, and I hope that uh, uh, a wide range of individuals will, will, um, will take advantage of the opportunity to serve. Uh, we're, we're better served when our elected representatives reflect the community that sends us into office, and, um, and I will continue to encourage individuals from diverse backgrounds to, to run for office. I've been doing that since uh, my days as county Democratic Party chairman, and I've done it um, as an elected official now. I've provided assistance and advice and, um, and, and money uh, to individuals from diverse backgrounds, and I'll continue to do that. Just to hop back to the body camera conversation, um, in, in, in your words, what do you think the most recent events in Baltimore does for you know, the issue of body cameras here in Montgomery County? Um, so the question is whether the riot in Baltimore uh, increases the likelihood that body cameras will be implemented here in Montgomery County. Also and the Freddie Gray, the, 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 the um, discussion on that as to what actually happened. The, the death of Freddie Gray in police custody. Um, there's no question, I mean, I think body cameras w would have happened as a result of, of the events, the, the Michael Brown's killing and, and others that, you know, it's, it was on everybody's minds before uh, Freddie Gray. But we have a big problem with the way police across the United States interact with black men. It's an enormous problem. We all have to ponder it and think about it. And having a video record of police officers um, will assist. And I think it'll assist police officers themselves to, to be purposeful and mindful um, when they're on duty, which I know that they are already, but um, we have cases of officers who just lost control of themselves and, and acted out of haste and acted out of impulse. And so I think that um, body cameras are a good move and I support them. Switching topics entirely to the planning board applicants. Um, so, from what I understand, Casey Anderson and Norman Dreyfus both reapplied, and uh, one other applicant who would be new has applied. So, I was curious for um, what you are looking for in applicants to the planning board, and also how you feel the planning board has done in the past 
few years? I know you just received Great. the update. That's a great question. So on the status of applications for the planning board and who's likely to fill those seats and how is the planning board doing? Uh, number one, I, it's quite common that where a commissioner is at the conclusion of his first term, he is reappointed to a second term where the council is satisfied that that commissioner is fulfilling his responsibilities. And in the case of Chairman Anderson and Commissioner Dreyfus, I fully intend to support their reappointment. I think they're excellent commissioners. I think each of them brings different perspectives and skills, but we're very fortunate to have them, and we're fortunate to have their three colleagues. And if you look at the planning board uh, with Casey Anderson, Norman Dreyfus, um, uh, Amy Presley, uh, uh, Natalie Fani Gonzalez, and um, Mary, um, I'm sorry, now I was doing so well. Mary Wells Harley. Um, we, we do have commissioners who do broadly reflect the demographics of our community, and all of them bring great skill and conscientious approach to their work. And I think the planning board is in as good a place as, as I've ever known it. I, I think they all get along extremely well, even though they bring different perspectives to the task. And, and um, they're enormously productive. I mean, my gosh, in the last year, we went through the zoning rewrite. We've pumped out a large number of master plans. We're continuing to do so. We have confidence in their long-range judgment. We've tasked them with an outside look at our school system and its needs uh, and how the population in the schools will grow and can we think outside the box in terms of ways of building school buildings. And we only do that because we have confidence that the planning board is um, creative and thoughtful and future-oriented. So um, I'm delighted with the performance of the planning board, and I'm specifically delighted with Chairman Anderson and Commissioner Dreyfus and their three colleagues, and I fully intend to support both of them uh, re serving another term. So for so since there is one applicant who is not a, a re reappointment, um, I mean, what would you be looking for in someone who doesn't have planning board experience, but what kind of experience would you want them to bring to the table? At the present time, I'm not looking for alternatives to Chairman Anderson or Commissioner Dreyfus. I think they've, both of them have earned a second term. If I can, and I'm just learning this myself, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the school board has put out um, a statement on the passing of Dr. Vance. Yes. Paul Vance. C can you talk about his work here in the county, he served for eight years, I think yes. it was. Yes, he was our school superintendent. He was also a, a distinguished community leader. He was president of the Montgomery County NAACP. Um, I know Dr. Vance. I'm, I, I'll miss him. Um, he, he was a, a distinguished spokesperson for the needs of all students. Um, we, he, he bears some of the credit for the outstanding reputation that our school system enjoys. We're widely recognized as one of the very best in the United States, and every superintendent who served very much, including Dr. Vance, gets the credit for that. He, he um, uh, understood the, the needs of every part of our community, and, um, and he will be missed. But do you think also, as we're, here we are talking about Baltimore and young African-American men and how they're regarded and, you know, educational opportunities. Here in Montgomery County, he addressed uh, some problems we were having. Didn't he, he certainly did. I, I think that Dr. Vance um, did not allow elected officials to ignore the needs of the uh, less achieving segments of the, of the school population and um, helped us focus on, on equity and, and distributing resources in a way that um, assists those who need the most help. Okay, anything else? Great, well I'm really delighted that you all show up on Mondays. It's really a great opportunity for me and, and thank you very much.